Ismit platform, partnering mm -hmm. with uh, uh, Clarinet. Uh, we are doing this uh, case meets regularly on every Friday 8 p.m. Uh, and as of now, we did 46 uh, case meets. And this one is uh, our partner, DigiShield, and then now Clarinet is coming uh, with us. And if, this one is our tribute and uh, celebration also of uh, Platinum Jubilee year of our ISA National. With that, our city branch also celebrating 25th year of ISA City Branch Foundation. So we are doing this uh, one of the celebration part, and we will do uh, with like uh, regularly. We are doing this. Even we are uploading these sessions on YouTube also. Uh, our channel is ISA City Branch Nanded. Uh, for private forum point of view, we are keeping every topics on that point of view. So private practitioner can uh, listen regularly on uh, YouTube also. Uh, so uh, viewers for uh, <coughs> today's stalwart Dr. J. V. Divyatya sir, uh, he own almost thumping majority with President elect this year. Sir, I am uh, once again congratulations uh, to you from all our ISA members of ISA City Branch Nanded. Uh, and that day we did within one hour voting also. So I am <laughs> with this. Uh, uh, today's topic is uh, quality and safety indicators in anesthesia practice. Uh, I will introduce a sh uh, short uh, intro of you because everyone knows uh, in even periphery or in metros, everybody knows you, sir because you did almost 500 talks in a 10 years it's almost alternate year. you are busy in every day as a speaker still i will introduce you uh, sir is a president elect sir is a professor in hod department of anesthesiology uh, critical care and pain tata memorial hospital everybody knows i am also sir a student i am also and uh, sir is a now director he is in new position in now he is director at homi baba cancer hospital punjab Sir did PG diploma in medical legal uh, systems also. Sir was past editor in chief, IJA, past president ISA Mumbai, past ISA West Zone GC member, scientific chairman, ISOCON 20, 2011. Sir was <coughs> almost 30 years, he is a teacher for MD uh, courses. Sir uh, also examiner for MD and DM um, courses. Sir is a MCI assessor for MD uh, courses. Sir is a past president uh, in uh, critical care medicine. Sir, past president for All India Difficult Airway uh, Associations. Sir, is uh, also past president for Oncology and Perioperative Care. Sir, uh, almost published 180 journals, uh, publications has done till now with 20 book chapters. And everybody knows uh, more than 500 now he did uh, lectures last 10 years. Uh, sir, welcome you. Uh, I am uh, really, really thankful to you that you accept our invitation and you, you came on platform. Please share, share sir, your screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Sachin, for inviting me to speak here. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have to thank you, you and the city branch for a lot of things. But first, I want to congratulate you for completing the city branch foundation. And, uh, also, of doing this wonderful activity to keep going every week for almost a year is a wonderful uh, uh, venture. It's great that you are doing it uh, every week, and I'm very happy that uh, you are part of this. Uh, today. Thanks. So today you have given me a very difficult topic to speak. And, uh, that is Yes. Can you still hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Clearly, no issues. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, this is a very important topic uh, for all of us as anesthesiologists, uh, but it is also a little difficult. So, just to start off, I'll uh, start by introducing some terminology. And, you know, like, what do you mean by quality? And essentially, quality means that you adhere to pre-established criteria or standards. So there are some standards. And if you will stick to those standards and you work according to those standards, you are probably giving reasonable quality of care. Right? In order to maintain quality, you have to have go through a process which is called quality assurance. And that is which is focused 
that gives everyone confidence that the whatever healthcare we develop uh, we deliver that's whatever anesthetics we deliver are will be according to the norms or according to the standards and then we also have to undertake a process of quality improvement which means that we assess what we do and if we find that we are short or we are not doing something well then we try to improve it or we actually try to just see how we can keep doing better at every point in time right so this is all part of terminology and in anesthesia practice some of quality and safety are very tight interlinked because if we are not doing safe anesthesia we are not providing good quality anesthesia and even if you are doing safe anesthesia you still need to improve the quality of our care to improve patient outcomes right so when we start talking of standards i mean who sets the standards i mean it could be anyone it could be the isa it could be some world uh, federation it could be a regional society for example isa nanded could get together or uh, uh, or you could have a more wider regional sort of uh, i say marathwada sort of uh, or i say maharashtra chapter can formulate but essentially it's a standard which has been laid down by some persons who have gone who have some standing in society and in the uh, in science right so for example the i say has got guidelines on preoperative fasting it has got guidelines on preoperative investigations but the i say does not have standards for some things like for example there are no standards minimal standards for monitoring or medications now in some ways you know people say well, it's a good thing because let's say for example the isa says that it is mandatory to have capnography to confirm the position of your endotracheal tube in the trachea right the already difficult airway association guidelines say that you should have uh capnography the isa doesn't say that one of the reasons probably why the isa has not made it as a monitoring standard is because many people don't have capnography and they don't have access to capnography so but you know then the problem is that suppose someone is starting a new hospital and you say i want a capnograph in that hospital they'll say okay i don't mind buying you a capnograph but where is the guideline that say that you must have a capnograph tell me does the society guideline say that you should have a capnograph and then even if someone wants to buy a capnograph you are not able to provide the standard right so that means today if we say that you should have this standard you should have this uh, guideline it means that you should aspire towards that you should move towards that if you don't have it today it's all right but maybe in the next one year or two years or five years all nursing homes in Mar in maharashtra should be equipped with a capnograph but provided that that standard is there right the standard is laid down if we don't lay down a standard then people say there is no need so it very uh, ironically or very paradoxically or very sadly capnographs are used for laparoscopic surgery routinely as a standard but capnographs are still not used routinely to confirm endotracheal intubation uh, when you're putting in a when you're doing a tracheal intubation so having standards helps in some ways but some people feel that oh my god if uh, if there is a problem with my intubation if the isa has said that you should have a capnograph right it not have a capnograph so i will be held uh, uh, negligent by uh, by a consumer court or by some court you know but again there are ways of uh, thinking of thinking that sort of thing but at the bottom line is at a, at some stage if you want to assess quality you have to have a standard and the question is who sets the standards it could be various people who could set standards okay and uh, for example the world federation has also set some uh, standards uh, now this is the isa uh, minimum monitoring standards in their guidelines for practicing anesthesiologists so we if you go to isa website there is a section on the private practitioners forum okay and there there are guidelines for practicing anesthesiologists and these are the mandatory minimum mandatory standards that have been written for the operating room so one is the presence of a qualified and registered anesthesiologist right make sure registration is uh, intact and current you should do a pre op checkup and investigation and optimize the patient there should be the presence of an anesthesia machine or workstation and monitoring equipment and when you look at monitoring equipment it says that you should have multi para monitors including a pulse oximeter ecg nibp and etco2 now etco2 again has been made mandatory for laparoscopic surgeries and use of closed circuit and desirable 
in all cases of general anesthesia. So again, you know, this is a way to help our members so that they don't get caught for uh, not having a capnograph. But at the same time, it doesn't uh, compel people to use capnographs or to install capnographs in the nursing home. So Ajahn is setting up a, a nursing home. He'll have a capnograph because he's going to do laparoscopy. But if a gynecologist or if uh, some med some other person is doing, they may or may not have it. So that's it. They should follow a safety checklist and you should have an adequate facilities to manage an emergency in that hospital or to transfer a patient if required. So this is what the IC says for practicing anesthesiologists. Okay. Now, this is what the World Federation has said, right? So it's got some standards which it help, which is a sort of laid down and it doesn't, and it, uh, doesn't talk of a standard, a minimum standard. It talks of recommendations. Right? So, for example, in infrastructure, the World Federation recognizes that in many places there is lack of access to equipment, you know, and uh, of uh, even simple things like uh, pipe gases and cylinders are in short supply in many parts of the world. So, they say you should have access to all these sort of things. And so, in their high, so like I said, they don't say mandatory or uh, desirable. They say highly recommended, recommended, and suggested. So highly recommended means you should have it everywhere or everything. And these are the sort of, uh, it's a big list. I won't go through it. But they do talk about in the operating room, you should have intubation aids. You should have access to a defibrillator. You should have a pulse oximeter and a carbon dioxide detector. Not may not be a capnograph, but at least something which detects CO2, like some colored colorimetric devices. In the recommended, they do put continuous waveform cardiography and ECG monitoring and so on. Okay, and so they have rec highly recommended, recommended, and suggested. And same similarly for in for medications during which are to be used in the anesthesia, they have highly recommended, and that is ketamine. And thiopentone and propofol actually come in the recommended and not highly recommended, simply because ketamine is probably more universal, can be used by a less qualified person, it can be used probably by uh, trained physicians who are trained in anesthesia. Again, remember the world WHO is catering not only to professional anesthetists like us, but also to uh, poorly resourced areas where they are sort of, uh, they've got paramedics uh, or something giving anesthesia. So maybe that's why ketamine has probably come in over there. Okay, And so what they have said, what the World Federation says is they don't have a mandatory list or, a man, or, a, or an optional list. They keep it as recommended, highly recommended, and so on. And they leave it to individual societies or individual associations to set minimum mandatory standards for equipment and medicines during anesthesia. Okay. Now, what happens if you if you are not complying with these standards, right? So why do people not comply with these standards? You have to identify the problem. For example, that uh, you know, you, you okay, for example, you don't have pulse oximeters. Even today, in many places in India, you don't have pulse oximeter. I remember from Nande, Dr. Someshwar Patange had uh, got the Life Box initiative into Nande, right? And in many parts of Maharashtra. But that means that many parts of Maharashtra did not have pulse oximeters in all their OTs or in all areas where anesthesia was being given or patients were being anesthetized. So that's a problem that you don't have pulse oximeters. Then you find out the problem assessment that how, is it going to be harmful? Find out the cause. Is it a cost issue? Is it a supply issue? Is it an availability issue? Is it a breakdown issue? Is it you know non-availability of spares? So you find out why pulse oximeter is not available or why pulse oximetry is not working. And you know, so you find go to the root cause and then you try and find a solution. Right? Now, life box is a charitable thing. You can have a solution, someone can donate pulse oximeters. But then you have to look after maintenance and so on. So you have to find a solution which will solve the problem, come up with a plan for implementation, and then implement the corrective action. Right. So that's a full sort of cycle that you do. And then you monitor and see what happens once you put your corrective plan in place. So you find out what is happening. And essentially what you do is you have these three pillars of safety and quality. Right. So you have these three pillars of safety and quality, with structure, process, and outcome. So structure is you see, you know, how, what, what is available for you. Process is what are your SOPs or what are your ways of functioning. And then you look at the outcome. Okay? So that's the standard sort of uh, uh, pillar of quality. So in structure, you know, you can have 
various sort of things. I mean, some of this terminology is vague, uh, but essentially, if you talk of design, you might say that, okay, how should the OT be? You know, should you have a room AC or should you have a central AC or should you have a split AC? Uh, after COVID, some people are asking, should we have a facility to have negative pressure in some ORs or is it okay to just have a standard OR? So that's design, right? What sort of, should you, is it a must to have laminar airflow or is it just a simple, uh, uh, this thing, uh, air conditioning, all right. Technology, so what sort of technology do you have in your, uh, or do you have a ordinary anesthesia boils machine? Do you just have a bag and bottle? Or do you have a, more of a workstation, you know, or do you, or do you have a, one of, either a simple workstation or one of the advanced workstations? Or that's all part of your technology, okay? Uh, very importantly, what is a sort of workforce? Now, and now, you know, in a hospital, in an institution, in a big department, you have to look at all these things, right? What are the qualifications and so on? But I would say that even for people working in small hospitals or individual practitioners, it is essential that you maintain it. I mean, it's there for everyone, right? So all I'm trying to say is that these things don't apply only to big hospitals or big departments or corporate hospitals or government hospitals. They apply to anyone who's working, right? Any setup where you're working, whether it's a one 20 bed nursing home or a 200 bed hospital or a 2000 bed medical college, you have to look into all these sort of things. So you have, we have to upgrade our skills. We have to maintain our skills. We have to learn new things, right? We have to make sure that we are not stressed and burdened at work. We need to have uh, adequate time for rest, relaxation. How do we do that? Maybe we have a group. Maybe we have uh, colleagues who fill in for us at various points in time. And so these are all the sort of things that you do with your structure. Then you should have some processes, right? Something which helps you work better and which increase, which improve or increase patient safety. And I think one of the things is all of us are very aware of is drug and medication errors. So you must have safe practices for drawing, labeling, and administration of drugs. Now, uh, I don't know how many of us label each and every syringe with the name of the drug, with the concentration of the drug, you know, and then we inject it accordingly. And we draw it up and label it immediately as soon as we do it. Sometimes when you're practicing as a solo, even if you're working solo in the OT, you say, I know, I know what drugs I'm making. I know I've only drawn this up. I've only drawn that up. And I always draw uh, analgesic in 5cc. I always draw my induction in 20cc. I always give my relaxant in 2cc and I have something else in 10cc. But again, you know, it's just something which can increase safety in case someone comes to relieve you, in case you go out and something happens that you, uh, you're just sure of what has been happening. So drawing. So and then you know the you have these uh, look alike and sound alike drugs. So again, you should have some mechanisms to distinguish and keep them differently and label them separately. So it's very nice to have these sort of processes. You can have process for infection control, protocols to do or various things. Now again, protocol for a big department is probably essential to have a protocol so that everyone does more or less the same thing. If there's just two or three people working almost as solo people, it's still nice to have a protocol so that. So that you effectively what you do becomes your protocol. But if you write it down, it's nice because then it's a, you know, if you if you go on a holiday and some someone else comes to leave, you say this is what I normally do. So you can give your protocol to him. Right? Checklist is extremely important, and we'll talk a little bit about checklist standards and guidelines from wherever. And very importantly, you must have rock, records and documentation of whatever you're doing. So documentation is doing writing down what you've done for the patient and record is keeping a record of all the cases that you have done over the last so many years. So I think this is mandatory that you should be able to have these things. And then you look at different outcomes, how the work that you do is affecting outcomes. Now, you know, the, I've just listed some over here, but at the end of the day, you know, today, Dr. Sachin Chandolkar will say, I'm a fantastic anesthetist. And I will say, no, I'm a better anesthetist than you. And how do we decide who is better? We can only decide who is better if we have some monitoring of the quality of care that we give. How much, what standards do we adhere to, right? What is the outcome of our patients? And when you say outcome of patient is not, I pulled out the tube. I mean, you may pull out the tube on the table, but the patient may have respiratory depression in the ward and die later. So extubation is not an endpoint. 
endpoint should be something which is patient centered and which reflects something which the patient values like was the pain relief and anesthetic management so good that he had no post op nausea and vomiting and he could uh, go home the next morning right so that's an outcome the sh a shortened length of stay so if my patients go home faster in a better condition then probably i am a better anesthetist right if my patients have more nausea and vomiting and have to stay in hospital to receive antiemetics and IV drip to take care of the vomiting, then my anesthetic technique was probably not very good. Right? So all those sort of things. So you have to look at important outcomes for the patient. And all this contributes to what we call as continuous quality improvement. Now, at the heart of continuous quality improvement is what we call as audit. That means looking at your outcomes of your patients, looking at what you are doing, okay? So you can do a simple audit, like how many patients that I anesthetized in a month had post-op nausea and vomiting, right? So, so that's how I've looked at, I've audited my results with respect to post-op nausea and vomiting. And then I find out that, oh my God, so many patients, 40% of my patients are having nausea and vomiting, then I need to do something about it. So now, when, now like I said, We've looked at the outcome that is vomiting, post-op nausea and vomiting. You have to look at the structure and the process. So structure could be whether your, uh, you know, whether your uh, OT is, uh, whether your, what is the uh, st structure of your OT? Is there something wrong in the OT environment? Is your uh, surgeon giving too much uh, pressure during laparoscopic surgery, right? Uh, or something like that. And process is that, are you giving antiemetics, prophylactic antiemetics as it's supposed to be described? Are you giving, say, only a drug like metoclobide? Or are you giving dexamethasone followed by uh, one of the other better, higher form of antiemetics, right? So you can look at the process. So you say, oh, I do, I've not been giving dexamethasone to my patient. So maybe I should start giving dexamethasone in addition to ondansetron, right? So I had dexamethasone and ondansetron in my antiemetic. So I've made a change. So I've implemented a new method. And then again, the next month, I evaluate performance and see what's happening to post-op nausea and vomiting. And if it's come down, it means I've done well. And then I may think, look, maybe I can bring it down even more. So maybe if I start using more propofol TIVA rather than inhaled anesthesia, maybe I can bring it down even further. So again, you repeat the process, right? The whole, and this is called an audit cycle, right? You audit, identify a problem, find a way of solving the problem, make some changes in the structure or in your process, make the change, evaluate your performance and check again, right? So this is a continuous quality improvement sort of thing. And you can do it for various sort of things. So what are the quality indicators for anesthesia, right? Now, if you look at the NABH manual, there are lots and lots and lots of things. And this is not meant to be mandatory or anything, but these are some of the things which people say. The percentage of modification of anesthesia plan. I plan to give epidural, but then something happened and I had to give general anesthesia. Percentage of unplanned ventilation following anesthesia. Or, or when you could not extubate a patient within, say, 15 minutes after reversal. So that something like that. So you could do that. Percentage of adverse events, mortality re related to anesthesia, of course, is very important. Percentage of unplanned return to OT is mainly a surgical thing. Okay. Percentage of rescheduling of procedures. How many patients were postponed on the table? Either before anesthesia or after induction of anesthesia. Right. So, percentage of patients who got the pro appropriate prophylactic antibiotic before surgery. Right. They went after the patient has been anesthetized. So, all these sort of, how many wrong site was, uh, surgery was done. So again, there are ways of preventing this for like the surgical safety checklist, but all these things are extremely important. Some are directly related to us and some are related to us as part of the OT team. Yeah. So for example, this is what we did in uh, TMH, right? In our hospital. So the pre-anesthesia check investigations in low risk patients. And we found that abnormal results were very low and therefore we stopped doing routine tests in low-risk patients for low-risk surgery. We looked at OT time starts and it was quite disastrous. In February 2015, it was only less than 60% time percent of times OT started on time. Then, of course, we cracked the whip and it was 88% in August, right? Now, this is another this thing. 90% had a documented pre-anesthesia check. 
right? So a pre-op check is a good quality indicator. It means that you've seen the patient. And you, if you remember, I guess some slides back, I spoke about the ISA private practitioner's guidelines. Again, it says you should do a private uh, PAC. So PAC is good for very many reasons. One is obviously it benefits the patient. It benefits you because you know what's happening about the patient, you know, the history and so on. You get a chance. And this is not on the table, right? It's pre the previous day, the previous day. But very importantly, as far as our image in society is concerned, with if you visit the patient pre-op, when the patient is conscious, awake, hale and hearty, his relatives are around him, they know who's an anesthesiologist. You get, you can tell the patient that I'm a doctor, I'm your anesthesiologist, and I'm going to give you anesthesia tomorrow. So there's awareness about you as a person and you as a professional, as an anesthesiologist, right? So it tells, it lets you know, lets the world know that an anesthetist exists. There is an someone called an anesthesiologist who has come and examined me and he's going to give me anesthesia and then he's going to look at me post-operative for pain management other sort of things, right? Machine check was done in 98% of patients' cases. Now that's good, but it means in 2% machine was not checked uh, before the case started. Surgery cancelled before anesthesia, 0.3% cancelled surgery after anesthesia, probably was a complication, 0.1%. And surgical safety checklist compliance was in 85%. Now, you might say 85% is good, but for a simple thing like uh, compliance with a checklist, going through a checklist, 15% non-compliance is actually not good at all. Right. So now this tells you that there is a problem and now we have to find ways of fixing the problem. So those were process measures. Now we also looked at some outcome measures, right? This is, so we looked at ICU mortality, hospital mortality, readmission and all those kind of things. But very importantly, okay, let's say that you say my intraop cardiac arrest rate was 11.8 per uh, 10,000 anesthetics. Okay, so you know, you've got a figure. Is it good or is it bad? And how do you, in other words, is there a benchmark? So you must be able to benchmark your performance against some benchmark. It could be our national benchmark. It could be an international benchmark. It could be your regional benchmark, you know, but there must be some benchmark to say that, okay, this is good. This is not good. You got to do better. Or, you know, this is horrible. You better buck up or you know, something like that. So for example, when we looked at compliance with preoperative fasting guidelines, we found that at that point in time, the median duration of fasting was six hours after liquids. Whereas the standard is two hours for clear liquids. It was five and a half hours after this for in pediatric patients, five and a half hours after breast milk. So patients were fasting for five and a half hours, whereas the benchmark or the recommendation is four hours. In other words, our patients were being fasted much more, much longer than what the benchmark required. 12 hours after solids, whereas the benchmark says after eight hours, you can do it. So again, clearly we were actually over starving our patients. We are keeping them more nil by mouth than was necessary. A post-op PONV rate was 5.5%. Is it good or is it bad? If you compare it with the literature, it should be anywhere from 89 to 42%. So I guess 5.5% was good. Post-op hypothermia, patients coming out of the OT and hypothermic into the recovery room was 23%. And the benchmark somewhere in the literature is 20%. means not more than 20% of patients should be hypothermic at the end of surgery. So we were close, but not very good, right? So... This was something we needed to improve on how we warm patients. Intraop cardiac arrest, the figure somewhere we found was 22.8. So we were half the rate of the benchmark. So that's, we are reasonably happy with that sort of thing. Of course, it should be zero, but ultimately you're dealing with patients. Many of them are high risks and problems do occur, but we seem to be having fewer problems than what the benchmark would say. So it's nice to always have a benchmark figure if you can get hold of one. So this is when we looked at our enhanced recovery from after surgery, right? The, the ERAS protocols. And we found that compliance to the interoperative parts of the ERAS protocol were actually quite good. So, so we are reasonably happy with the way we were doing our major GI surgery and that sort of thing. In the ICU, we looked at infection rates, right? Now, again, whenever you audit, whenever you audit your results, you must be honest and you must report accurately because this is for your own self-improvement, right? So when we first looked at our ventilator associated pneumonia rates in 2011, so this benchmark, this red line is the INICC benchmark, which is the median rate in uh, developing countries. 
And this one over here is the benchmark rate for America, for the United States of America. So between the, the benchmark for America is much, much lower than the developing countries. But our rate in 2011 was much higher than even the benchmark for the developing countries. So, of course, then we had a very tight sort of uh, infection control program to reduce VAP, and we introduced a number of measures. And you can see that over the years it came down, it came down to much below the developing country uh, benchmark, but was still not near the American benchmark. It's now closer because this is 2015, but we are still somewhere around here. So we are doing well, but maybe we need to do a little better to get to the, to meet the standard that benchmark that is there in the United States. Same way with our central line infections, very high initially, but now we've come down to the benchmark. So these sort of things help you in identifying a problem, knowing how big the problem is and doing something and then comparing yourself with some sort of benchmark gives you an idea of how you stand with respect to others who are doing similar things in your field. Okay. Now, in a big hospital, you will have a quality management system. There'll be a quality manual, there'll be SOPs, there'll be a manual about that. You'll have an officer who looks after quality. You'll have different committees which look at different aspects of quality management. You can do something similar within your own small nursing home if you have one, or if you go to a small nursing home, only your team will be smaller and the area that you cover will be smaller, but the activities are going to be similar. Now, whether you have a formal system, you have a formal officer or no, maybe you just take it on yourself that I will look after all quality things related to operation theater in this nursing home that I go to five days a week. So then you can do many of these things yourself, right? So quality, and safety are not just something which are buzzwords for corporate hospitals. They are something which should be inherent and important to each and every anesthesiologist wherever we practice. Okay. The next part is now, of course, safety. And you know, we all say that anesthesia is very safe and it is much safer than it was earlier. So for example, the 70s, before the 70s, this was the mortality of uh, per million anesthetics, right? As a where it was contributory and where it was this thing, it's come right down. It's come down to very, very low levels in after the 90s. So anesthesia has certainly become safer and we all know there's been lots of improvements in the way we function. But if you look at high income countries versus low income countries, all the fall in mort mortality is in the high income countries. In the low income countries, and I think India counts as one of them, low, low development index uh, countries, we find that the mortality has not changed much compared to the 70s, right? So, and that is because there are still lots of things we need to do. And therefore, it means we need to do lots more to help our patients and make anesthesia safer for our patients. Okay. So, this was something which was there in the Lancet Global Health, that two-thirds of the deaths from anesthesia were due to preventable complications. And most of the complications centered around airway management and aspiration. And the risk factors were GA and a rural setting. And rural setting encompasses many things, right? It's not just the place. It is also that the, maybe the whether there was an anesthesiologist or some uh, sort of anesthesia practitioner giving the anesthetic, whether they were well-trained, whether they had enough equipment, whether they had uh, expertise, whether, you know, so all those sort of things come into that uh, rural setting and whether all drugs were available or not, whether facilities for resuscitation were available or not. So all those things are to be a part of this problem. Okay. So when we look at uh, how we should organize ourselves for safety, you know, we can start at the national level, hospital level, but we'll stick to individual level of the clinician, that's the anesthesiologist and the microsystem that is the patient, right? So we talked a little bit about the hospital when he talked of quality indicators and that kind of thing. But now, one of the problems at the individual level for the in individual practicing anesthesiologist is in many parts of the world and parts of India, uh, there is a lack of adequate trained personnel, adequate equipment, adequate drugs and medications. The problem is that culture of safety is almost non-existent, you know. So we all think we are very safe and we work safe, but we are not, we don't have a system to promote and encourage and uh, evolve safety. So from that point of view, you know, I'm very happy that uh, 
Nanded City branch has chosen this topic because it is something which is so important, but it is appears to be very theoretical and it appears to be something exotic, but actually it is something which should affect each and every minute of the time that we are practicing. Right? Our, it is unfortunate, but it's true that sometimes nobody listens to us, surgeons disregard us, administration doesn't know, doesn't really bother, they'll do anything to buy a fantastic laparoscopic stack or a robot for a surgeon, but they will you know, you ask them for some simple equipment and they'll say, oh, no, no, it's not going to generate money. Who, why should we spend money on that sort of thing? Okay. We are not well paid. Lots of issues about the way we are paid. Sometimes that uh, the reduces our morale. There's some burnout because we are under stress. We do work very hard, but we probably feel we are not adequately rewarded. So all those issues are there with the clinician. But when it comes to the patient, Medication safety is something which is extremely important, right? So we know that a lot of drug errors do occur. One in 20 perioperative medication administrations and every second operation, there's some figures from the West, results in a medication error, an adverse drug event, or both. Okay? And most of the medication errors are preventable. So one of the challenges that a WHO identified in 2017 was medication without harm. So safety uh, medication safety, right? And I think I don't, I'm not going to tell you how you can make your medication safe. Right? Look at the, you know, look at the vial or the syringe, look at the vial or look at the ampule, read it properly, take it to a syringe, label the syringe, label before you draw. So you draw the right, draw, check your label, cover the needles, take uh, infection control precautions, don't leave syringes and lying open. Okay, give, make sure giving the right dose, all those sort of things. I mean, medication safety is something look alike, sound alike drugs, very, very important. And, you know, we can keep on making lists of this look like that and that look like something else. Atropine adrenaline was a very common sort of mistake. Now, some years back in uh, Kama Hospital in Mumbai, children who were supposed to receive one of the vaccines, they, they were given a, something from a vial. And that had an orange sort of label, which was actually succinylcholine in those days. So, and they all got succinylcholine and those patients started having twitches and some of the babies died. And people thought they were convulsing because they got those uh, twitches from scoline. But ultimately when they found out the vaccine vial and succinylcholine looked similar, someone picked up from somewhere, they picked up a scoline vial and gave scoline from that vial to multiple children. And some of them had respiratory apnea and diet. So, you know, these things can happen anywhere and we need to be very careful because if you are a solo anesthetist, you are the sole person who's responsible for that problem and therefore you must be very careful about it. Okay, so safe injection practices is extremely important. Never, so apart from making mistakes in drug error, one of the things that we can do harm is transmit infection. Okay, and it, some years back, uh, many years back, there was an outbreak of fungal infection in patients who received propofol. Okay, so they all had uh, bloodstream infection from Malassezia furfur, which normally causes that uh, you know a skin uh, disease. But this went into the blood and caused a uh, fungemia, and it was traced to propofol syringes which were lying open, propofol uh, uh, which were lying unused, right? Uh, so they were drawn up and they were lying there and they were, they were drawn up in the morning and left there and then got used a few hours later for the second or third or fourth case. But the propofol lying there was served as a medium for uh, growth of this fungus and that got injected into the patient and these some of these patients got uh, bacteria, fungemia because of that. <clears throat> so make sure we are Injection practice are hygienic. Wash hands when you're giving injections. Swap the ports with uh, alcohol or spirit. Okay. Never administer indication of the same syringe to multiple patients. So it may sound like a cost-cutting thing, but uh, a syringe-saving uh, technique. But it's not a very safe or a hygienic practice at all. Okay. And so all these sort of things, like you know, we should not be doing all these sort of things. It, some. If you're transfusing blood, always have a two-person check. So you check and ask someone else to check. So it's independent of you. So you make sure 
and there is no mistake. The surgical safety checklist is a big uh, sort of, uh, uh, it's a very simple thing, but it's a big advance in patient safety. And in one study, which the, we did it, uh, going through a surgical safety checklist reduced complications by almost 40%. And not just intra-op complication, but even post-op complications. It's things like wrong side of surgery or the wrong side or the wrong patient can be eliminated if we stick to a proper meticulous this thing of the checklist. So there are some things that you do before induction of anesthesia, okay? And that is you identify the patient, patient confirms the identity, mark the side or site of operation. Make, is your anesthesia check done? Is your medication check done? Have you got a pulse ox on the patient and is it functioning? Does the patient have any drug allergies? Is there a difficult airway? And is there a chance for blood loss, okay? And then before skin incision, all the team, you everyone introduces themselves to each other. You know? So that's uh, maybe in a small nursing home where you, you, everyone knows everyone, it's not a big deal. But sometimes in my department, we've got 100 PGs and uh, sometimes we don't know who's there. And so we don't know who are the surgical residents sometimes, right? So it's nice that everyone introduces themselves. So again, it sort of creates some kind of a team spirit as well. Okay, confirm the name procedure. Has antibiotic prophylaxis been given? So you check that. And then you sort of go through all these things, right? And in the post-op period, I mean, at the end of surgery, before closure and before the patient leaves, make sure that the needle count, gauze count, mop count, all that is correct. Space specimen has been labeled, okay? For example, we have a special thing about throat pack, whether the throat pack's been removed. So we make sure the throat pack's been removed if you had head neck surgery. So you should have to have a surgical safety checklist. So that's another very important sort of thing for safety. You must prevent healthcare infection. And it, it is unfortunately not very well realized that some of our practices may also be resulting in bloodstream, bloodstream infection, right? Our role is, of course, to make sure we are doing all our procedures in a hygienic fashion and antibiotic pro prophylaxis within 30 minutes of incision. After induction, before incision, you should, we should be making sure that the antibiotic is being given, okay? So hand hygiene is extremely important. And lastly, you must your documentation must be absolutely perfect. I don't think this can be emphasized uh, more. Documentation is the heart of everything that you do. And if you, what is not written is not done. So even if you've done something brilliantly, if you've not written it down, it's almost as good as not being done, right? And you must audit your cases. So you must, I think this is something which everyone must do. Keep a simple audit, what, what you did to your patient, what drugs you gave, what happened to your patient, did he have nausea and vomiting, did he have a lot of post-op pain, did he have shivering at the end of surgery, did he take too long to recover, uh, did he require oxygen for a prolonged period uh, after we shifted him to the ward, when did the patient get discharged, when, did the, was the, the patient have any complications, did he have any muscle weakness before he was discharged, was he able to walk uh, unaided? After you know, after you gave a spinal or an epidural, did he have tingling numbness on the fourth day or fifth day? Just simple thing, but just record them, record them and keep them. And then maybe you know you can at some stage you can fish out that information, and see whether if there's a problem occurring and something like. That. But this is something anyone can do. You just have to have the will to do it, and maybe you should know what you want to sort of record and what you want to keep. Okay. The last aspect I'll come to is errors and mistakes. Okay. Now, now, this is a very famous study, the Harvard uh, study, which showed that, uh, you know, 58% uh, of uh, patients who received medications had an adverse event. And 27.6%, I mean, more than half were preventable, and 276 were actually considered negligent because of negligence. And 26 resulted in permanent disability, and some resulted in patient death. So these are obviously we know that errors are bad, and you know so that patient safety is a huge problem. Seven percent of patients die, uh, suffer a medication error. But very importantly, this is what the Institute of Medicine said that it is not solely the healthcare workers who is to blame. If there is a harm, it probably means that the system was not in place, right? And you know a system has to be in place everywhere, whether you are in a hundred member department or in a four member OT, right? There has to be a system in place to prevent error or to make sure things don't go wrong. Okay, so let's not go into these errors and mistakes. These are this thing, but 
how do you when when something happens how do you approach that error so in the past we used to have this person approach that dr devetia did not look at the syringe he did not look at the label he just drew something and he injected something either gada is a moron or mbbs kaisa pass ho md md chodo mbbs kaisa pass ho gaya he doesn't deserve to be in this bloody hospital kick him out throw him out you know never call him again for some other cases that was a person approach but now we saying there is a system approach that it is guaranteed that every human is going to make a mistake right even the best of us is at some stage going to do something maybe not wrong but maybe something not exactly the right thing to do it's going to happen at some stage but there must be a system in place to see that even if i make a mistake you know something will prevent an adverse outcome from happening so all hazardous technologies possess barriers and safeguards and the question is not who blundered but how and why the defenses failed right so what was the system that will prevent me from giving a wrong drug to the wrong patient or wrong blood to the wrong patient right something like that and this is the theory which we call it the swiss cheese so swiss cheese is these blocks of cheese with holes in it right and normally what should happen is that if i if i make a mistake i go through this hole it will be blocked by this cheese over here so there will not be a mistake but every once in a while all the holes line up and then i make a mistake and then the system or the gaps in the system allow all the holes to line up and then i land up with an adverse outcome so the system should be such that if some mistake happens here there will be a block somewhere else so uh, and that system can be applied to an individual it can be applied to a group of people and it can be applied to the entire hospital okay so what we do what we did or what we are doing at tmh and this is for the icu is that we have critical incident reporting if there is a problem something is noticed it is reported it's an anonymous anonymous uh, uh, reporting and then we pick up these reports and we sort of someone screens them and then we have a team of one or two or three people who investigates the the incident right and they do what is called as root cause analysis they find out what all are the factors what are the structure process structure and the process factors what were the system factors what were the personal factors what are the team factors were the communication problems were the interpersonal relationship problems you know mai tere se baat nahi kare i won't really tell you what i'm doing or something like that was that that lead to the problem and then the whole team sits and discusses what is it and takes suitable action and then implementation feedback and survey so this is how we sort of approach that error so we try and fix the problem once in a while some individual has goofed up badly not followed protocol even when you are told to do something did not do it individuals may need to be pulled up but very often it is a system which also needs to be rectified okay so for example one of our patients got vancomycin in the recovery room into the arterial line at that time it was a simple venflon which was put on the artery and it was covered with tape and but after that and it looked like an iv line so the nurse thought it was an iv line and she injected it there but it was an arterial line so now we made sure we had a different type of cannula and we had labels all over here as well as here to identify it as an arterial line and even this so bag pressure bag was identified as an arterial line so no one could put anything into the iv bottle over here either so it's just simple ways of how things can do but at the bottom of all this is that there must be a culture of safety you cannot no one will report if you know you're going to be japped and you're going to be shamed and bullied because of something you did wrong so every error or every mistake is an opportunity for others to learn including yourself it now it can happen in a department it can happen in a city branch so maybe once in three months a few of the people from the city branch say i did this then the response should not be to sala gada and that sort of thing is okay you did this what why do you think something like this happened and what could be done different you could have that same thing in your hospital or in your nursing home that you know if this happened the surgery but if the surgeon are tu ye galti ki abhi main tere ko kabhi nahi bulayega no that's not going to be helpful and that culture of safety must be there that you acknowledge your mistake and use it as an opportunity to improve and to make sure that similar mistakes never happen again right so encouragement of collaboration across ranks and disciplines to seek solutions so that is very very important whether you are in a 100 bed 1000 bed hospital or a 10 bed nursing home that culture of safety must be there amongst the people who are working in that institution okay 
Now, you know, doing this, you know, some people say, Kya, Dr. Devetia was a Tata Hospital, Mumbai, mein bait ke, America, ja ke aaya. he's done all these fancy ideas. So, hey, well, this is all nonsense. It doesn't uh, work in India. It doesn't work in Maharashtra. It doesn't work in Nandir. It doesn't work in uh, Aurangabad. So, so, it is not that. It, it works everywhere. We have to have that slight change in thought and change in philosophy. Right? Some people say, isme kya hai? Roj karta. if you're doing it, that's fine. But very often, if you look at it, you may not necessarily be doing all the things that's supposed to be done. But if you're doing it, that's fantastic. Okay. So, unfortunately, safety is never, you know, given a big prominence. So, for example, when you see a picture like this lady in the car, what is the first thing that strikes you? Well, actually, she's not wearing a seatbelt. I'm sure you noticed that. Okay. But you know, no one's going to give you a trip to Switzerland to because for a talk on safety. There's nothing fancy about it. It's not cool. In fact, to be safe is to be boring because you have to do things repeatedly in a particular way to make sure not being a mistake. Shortcuts are more exciting, right? So people who don't even auscultate the chest after they put in the tube, even the surgeons are thinking, hey, fantastic confident anesthetist. He, he's so sure his tube is in, he doesn't even bother to auscultate, right? So that's cool, right? That's uh, that's deadly. But someone will come or do a five-point auscultation. He'll check the, he'll go and make sure there's a capnograph there before he starts. Okay, he sees it. He ye, ye, what time leta hai? Fukat ka sala monitor lagata hai. You know, he's just too fixed on monitors and gadgets and that sort of thing. So, you know, so shortcuts are sometimes more ex exciting, right? Uh, so, and it's boring because you know the number of complications that occur are not that many. So even if you do something unsafe, even if you do it not too well, even if you do it badly, odds are there will not be a serious complication. Only once in a while you have a serious complication, but that could ruin you for life. But 95% of the time you do not have anything. So you say, Isme kya hai? Why, do I don't bloody, I just, I just don't even auscultate the trachea. I know my tube is in and nothing has happened. I have given so many 20 years experience, nothing has happened. Next day, you might have a problem, but today you can safely say, I have done it like, like this and nothing has happened, right? Then people say it works in the West. Some say the private hospital, Lama, nursing home, mein kya, it doesn't work. But it works everywhere, right? That culture of safety and the thought thinking about safety is important all across the place, right? So, and again, safety is not only for you, it is for everyone. Now, this one, I'm sure he loves his family, but he's piled four of them on his motorcycle and he's the only one wearing a helmet. But now, Nothing has happened. He's never known. But in case there's a problem, you know, you know, you, he can't say that uh, these are the other three are going to be immune to a head injury. So, so safety is for everyone. It's not just for one person. And we have to develop our sort of team. If it's a small nursing home, you, your surgeon, surgeon assistant, nurse, the favorite ward boys who are there, they're all part of a team. So you, you make a team wherever you are, wherever you are, get people together and work towards increasing patient safety. Because at the end of the day, if you want things to change, if you want others to change, you need to change yourself, right? So thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'll be happy to take questions if there are any. Dr. Sachin, Dr. Saleh. Sachin. Yeah, Sachin. Hello. Yes, sir. Very, very nice presentation, sir. And uh, I'm very thankful to you from all our SA members uh, that we got this uh, evening. We are uh, very much keen to hear from you this topic and, and really enlighten uh, the knowledge you share with us. Sir, uh, Dr. Sali, sir, our MCIC president is also on our platform. Sir, please speak, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Jiggy. Uh, it is uh, they, this my, my uh, sincere advice uh, to all our colleagues that quality and safety should become a passion for the anesthetist. That is number one. Because unless and until we inculcate this culture of quality and safety, uh, this is going to help whatever incidences have happened so far 
what we have observed last more than uh, three decades we do so many things but we don't right which the dr devate are right to point it out so many times we don't write and we do it but we don't write when it really comes for the evaluation of that case then we are in trouble that's number one point number two uh, we are uh, now that is strongly mentioned that uh, so far we were talking of, about the nabh and uh, this quality indicators uh, we said quality indicators some of the safety <clears throat> drug errors some or other time we come across the drug errors we everyone has uh, done so some or minor or major drug errors and which the another major uh, 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 error which are happened in the form of safety for the anesthesia globally anesthesia services are considered at par with the our uh, airline services for what anesthesia at par with the pilots those who are that type of safety we have to maintain and uh, international uh, patient safety goals <clears throat> and branches taken at the very serious level and uh, we still are missing in the communication which is another uh, uh, very important part communication has to be improved between the patient surgeon and the anesthetist many times we just go and do here and there with the patient's evaluation we are still, whatever cases we are referred to the tertiary care hospital we come across the complicated patients uh, which are happening at the peripheral level and then we realize that somewhere this has been missed because of that this complication has happened while inducing patient or intraoperative patients this is what that's my uh, advice to all uh, all this uh, one of the very and this topic has to be such in repeatedly discussed in all the platforms but we always come to discuss this because very good topic selected sachin can i ask and thank you sir thank you yes sir informed consent we used to take surgeon used to take the consent in earlier days and we used to give ha uh, consent day chala jaya but it is not like that in today's era it is the separate consent for the anesthesia services is required yes. and that has to be informed consent we need to mention and we have to sign that consent the consultant mm -hmm. is going to give the anesthesia yes balaji uh, sir thank you divatiya sir Uh, as usual excellent talk on this subject and it's really always pleasure to hear you sir uh, i wanted to just uh, ask you one question you have worked as a head of the department and you have been at a, such a good position and you run the department what measures or how you try to maintain the quality of anesthesia care uh, among your colleagues how you assess their uh, quality whether they are delivering quality anesthesia and if at all there are some lacunes how you motivate them on this aspects that uh, tough question but the answer is easy so i think all uh, we are very fortunate to have colleagues who are very happy to work as a team right uh, now you asked a very important question is how do we we assess the quality of their anesthesia how do we know that they're giving good anesthesia bad anesthesia so one and again it is not uh, so one one thing that i put up some indicators that we sort of looked at is it how much your patients are fasting so the, that was the pediatric group they looked at and they found they were starve keeping the patients starving for much more than it was required so again they made the changes we looked at uh, how many patients are being uh, uh, who are not having a pre op checkup so it's not the quality of the anesthesia itself but it's the quality of the surgery and anesthesia departments how they are functioning so if patients are being seen not that was common when we have to do things to do now uh post op nausea vomiting so how many patients get post post op so we found that breast patients are very having very high level of post op nausea vomiting so again we made sure that people gave uh, dual antiemetics you know the dexamethasone as well as ornithine so, so you pick up problem and you or you find out problem to the audit and then you sort of start working and then once we identify a problem we sit as a group and we sort of say what we could do better what we can change and that kind of thing in the west 
in the West, you know, where they have these online uh, information systems. So everything, all the data is coming online from the monitor. The head of department, one of the persons I met, he sits in his office and he sees how much tidal volume is being given. If someone is giving more than 8 ml per kilo, he will ask him why he's giving more than 8 ml per kilo. You get all the blood sugar levels. And you say, why is this patient having blood sugar of 250 when he's not a diabetic? That, that's an indicator for them that number of times your blood sugar is more outside the range, you know, of say 150 to 180 or 200. So they will look at that. Then they will look at, for example, unplanned extubation rate, unplanned uh, ventilation rates. So why are, if, if it's coming from some particular OT, maybe it's too cold, maybe that anesthetist was not warming the patients adequately, it will cause the warming sort of uh, for the little more, you know. So you make sure that they're getting monitored temperature and warming is being done. So these are sort of things you would do. Essentially, everyone be honest and say, yes, I found this problem. And then we all sit and we decide how we are going to solve it. Yes, sir, you have mentioned very rightly, you mentioned it should not be a blame game, rather it should be a fault finding, uh, a system fault finding system that has to be in place. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, sir, I wanna, sir, Soveshu, sir, you want to ask? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, sir. Sir, uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful lecture. Actually, uh, some days before, uh, we have a talk with Dr. Atul Gawande uh, from USA. And uh, he told me that uh, there is a data uh, which shows that uh, there is a less uh, percentage of caesarean section in the government hospital and uh, more percentage in the private hospital. So I said th there is a lack of data from the private hospital. Government hospital has to put their data to the government authorities. But is there any way that private hospital should put their data? Uh, so Dr. Soveshwar, that was a very difficult question. I don't know whether I can answer it. Uh, <laughs> and I think Gawande actually he is one of the originators of the surgical safety checklist. And if you read, yeah, his yeah, he's, he's, he's from Nandir, sir. Yeah, he's from Nandir, yeah. And yeah, yeah. a very nice book called The Checklist Manifesto. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If yeah. you uh -huh. get rid of it, you should read it. It's about how they hit upon yeah. the idea of the surgical safety checklist. You know. yeah. uh, one is uh, there is no system in India for mandatory reporting of data by private hospitals to any regulatory authority. Right. So the government of Maharashtra will take data from all its uh, all its government hospitals. Private hospitals may have data. They may choose to show you. They may choose not to show. But they can manipulate the data, sir. So there is no there is no verification of anything. Uh, uh -huh. Even in government data, it's there is no verification. I mean, I don't know what uh, if I'm the DMER or I'm the DGHS. I don't know. I have no way of knowing uh, whether the data submitted to me from the company only is correct or not. Yeah. So, but in the West, everything is on online. It's on a computer. So it's very difficult to fudge the data. So our data is manually entered and can always be, there's always room for doubt over there. It's not difficult to understand that in private hospitals, the monetary incentive for CCN are probably higher. Whereas in government, it's probably not. I, I don't know. I mean, it's all those sort of things. So, but yes. Accurate data is the key to know what is happening. If the Sir, can, can we do anything, anything from our ISA? Can we do? Can we go for it for from the ISA platform? See, I mean, ISA is not a regulatory body, so we can suggest that you should give data. Right? But we can perform any app app uh, regarding city wise, and everybody has to put their data daily. If I am doing five cases today, I have yeah. to put the data. So and there is, is uh, you can say success or all these things. If anything happened wrong, I have to run to the ISA also. So there is already an app, the ISA app, if you download Yeah, but there is, there is no um, is, uh, yeah, that I, I, I have to put my patient's name, everything, what type of anesthesia I am going to give. That so app you can develop. So it is there in that app. It's a very sketchy thing, but there is some data that you can feed in. You need to put your patient's name. But you have to put in the age, sex, weight, the type of anesthesia you gave, and whether anesthesia was eventful or uneventful. You can add more data to capture if you want. 
kind of study separately apart from we have been doing all their data but there is nothing that impels you to do that It means today if you don't fill your data i can't say you stop practicing from tomorrow right i can put a fine on you or anything like that so there is no mandate there is no regulation whatever you do is voluntary everything is manual so there can be mistakes and so on there is a problem with data collection that is why our data of covid is being many people don't believe our covid data because ya yeah, tumne aisa kaisa data collect kiya how you telling us so much our vaccination data is very good because it's captured from the app you know uh, yes sir from the website but our covid testing data those data so yeah so data is a weak so point if anything we can do to collect the data that's why actually so I was... so i'm sure it is very very difficult this issue in uh, uh, discussed so many times uh, in the private sector why uh, sections are uh, more and in government sector so that it, it will it, it will become uh, to force ah. the new one studies to become the member of iis ah. we can work on that a little more we develop any app that we will the make compulsory upcoming uh, people to become the member of iis yes so so that is okay but let's say you have a complication suppose you have a failed intubation a patient dies are you going to put it on the app yeah i have to put because iis is going to save me so no, that is if someone sues you the iis will save you right what if we have taken the um, um, lsc and everything from iis no so, Yeah, 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 but that is a your IS has only been the intermediary. The ultimately, your yeah. that is going to be decided by the insurance company yeah. to take an insurance with. IS has oh. helped you get a good premium, a good rate, and that kind of thing. IS may help you with your medical legal. Uh, no. But, actually, because we are lacking, we are the last uh, number in the uh, data collection and the audit report. These two numbers, we are right. very much. You're right. Down. You're absolutely right. I say uh, family uh, benevolent fund is something which will help everyone. Yeah, that is after death, sir. <laughs> But no, I mean, basically, uh, we are uh, we don't have any culture to uh, upload the data, day-to-day -day data. Even though like, since last quite, quite some time, uh, only complication wherever there are complication, it was decided in uh, Kolkata National Conference. And uh, neon company was going to monitor all those data, but uh, how many people are posting that data? Nobody is doing that. So, so that's why yeah. I suggest that everyone should keep a record of the data. Exactly. You, then upload it onto an app no. or upload it on something is a is a is good if we can do it. Then we'll have a national database. But each and every individual doing each and every case must have records of that case. Exactly. Yeah, but it should be compulsory. Unless and until it becomes compulsory, no one is going to put it um, on the record. And how to make compulsory? We have to think about that. I don't know. You can. Tell me, I have to call him. I am not going to do it. Now you call him. Let me like that. Jump bed. Or what? Slowly, slowly. You need a regulatory. You need a regulatory body to do it. Yes, yes, yes. But so actually, slowly, slowly, most of the nai, including nursing homes and even hospitals, they are going for EMA, and slowly, slowly, most of the data will be stored, and it can be uh, just connected and uploaded uh, to the. This will take another few years down the line, but it will happen. Absolutely yeah. right. The solution yeah. to this is electronic charting. Once everything becomes electronic, it is captured at source. No so no yeah. chance of manipulation. All data will go in of each and every case. When that happens across the board, that is, we'll have fantastic. Uh, Data. In coming another three four years, everything will be uh, EMR based. All the hospitals, the small 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 nursing homes, they are going for the EMR now because everybody has realized because the, the data is required for their future. Sir, sir, you mentioned uh, about uh, in safety checklist machine check. It's yeah. it's uh, in part of our PG routine also for uh, as a resident also. But uh, documentation of that machine check has not done in my PG days. Also, I am remembered always. Uh, even medical legal point of view, also I am asking this question because I did LLB, LLM also, and I'm I'm a consultant on three four private forums also, and advisor on IIM and IIC chapters also for state. But uh, that for anesthesia point of view, any anesthesiologist who is going to do any case, 
he never mentioned in papers he mentioned about histories and all he mentioned about his uh, past history and all but he never mentioned about machine check yeah. any protocol related to that in uh, other countries in india and isa regulations on that no so if you again if you go to isa private practice forum they attach some kind of a checklist and this surgical safety checklist that we have if you have that all ticked and signed and becomes part of your record then it's part of the record and if you tick the machine check done then you done the machine check so so you mean to say you can write means any anesthesiologist can write yeah. on paper that in his notes yes. machine checked yes yeah. it's okay That's fine. okay for uh, machine medical check legal okay. point of view also I, because you are also problem. from medical legal you did pg diploma in medical legal system so i am asking this question so i guess if it's written down and you said it's okay they cannot disbelieve you unless unless they produce three four witnesses okay oh sir i say he just came walked in the ot and put and started giving pen if they get four witnesses to say that then you are finished right yeah but if you've written machine check done it means you've done it so what i said earlier was what was not written is not done the corollary to that is what is written is done okay yeah that that's the dictum but i want to ask on that point only uh, is is any uh, protocol like uh, checking a safety checklist means uh, boils checks o2 check n2o checks or gas flow checks like that any uh, paper or any protocols is there you mean a detailed uh, checklist for the machine yeah yeah so that is a uh, that can be there but then it becomes a only a something for the anesthetist this surgical safety check yes 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 right but if you want you can have that just to help your residents or for yourself also to make sure you've done all the steps you know that you yes 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 the cylinder, you check the whole pipeline you check the flow meters you check all these things you can do that but overall if you're asking that if you've written that machine check done now a smart lawyer say what do you mean by machine check you know, you know something like that then yeah yeah where i did you check that the pressure in the oxygen was enough that the cylinder was not empty i mean all that can be asked but uh, but i don't think you i, I mean <laughs> uh, but uh, if you have a separate checklist you can always fill it up and attach it uh, uh, sir uh. Sachin, that is already there. What uh, Jiggy right from the beginning he said that surgical safety checklist, WHO checklist, it is been mentioned, and uh, by and large, most of the institutes those are accredited. They are following it. Without that, cases are not done. So it is but, there. Uh, but Doctor Sade, you will be amazed. You know, we have this uh, onco surge workshop in Tata where we, they get surgeons and they do live demos of surgery, and you have a lot of surgical uh, consultants from all over India who come to attend. they are they are very curious when they see us doing the surgical safety checklist before the case <laughs> show us give us a copy of the checklist so it is not being done in many places you know and i think it's something which must be done everywhere that surgical safety checklist it will save everyone from major problems so uh, i want to humble request from all our sa members city branch that when uh, as a part of your national forum uh, you are becoming Uh, that color coding part is major issue we face at periphery uh, different different companies coming up and uh, lot of color coding issues are there even uh, myself or anybody can uh, go through mishaps in ots so i am i'm request you humbly that you you should do something on that part in your tenure as a yeah i agree as bearer, in, office bearer in the uk there is a common code for that uh, the analgesic the narcotic has a blue color the relaxant has some color you know yes definitely one company which is making multiple things may have that code but other company may have some different code so you're right it is a problem uh, we can try and talk at least to the major manufacturer of anesthetic agents to see that they follow a certain code they have their own hang ups for branding hai hamara brand ko aisa lagta hai wo hamara logo ko match nahi hota hai no also no rabbit thing over but you're right we have we must make the effort you're absolutely right yes, yes. so we we were hoping uh, some improvements in uh, coming years uh, so i will conclude session with uh, our uh, permission with our state president dr hk sale sir msc sir 
कैन वी डू कल फॉर दिस थैंक यू सर थैंक यू आई एम आई एम आल्सो टेकिंग परमिशन फ्रॉम डॉक्टर बालाजी असिका ओका सर आवर नो प्रॉब्लम मैन आई एम आल्सो टेकिंग डॉक्टर पतंगे सर आल्सो शुड वी कंक्लूड दिस सेशन सर थैंक यू yes so i'm really happy so much yes i'm really happy sir you came on uh, this uh, lovely evening you uh, give a uh, valuable time of your uh, doing this session i'm really thank you sir from all our isa members from heart thank you dr sachin and i'm sorry i had to make you postpone the date because uh, i was somehow not available on certain dates which i had earlier said yes to are thanks for accommodating me and पंचर कम्प्लीट कर बिलकुल बोलू ना रिपीट रिपीट बोलू तुम्हारा मैं आता थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर